Awesome. You may be seated. Looked like the demon of technology struck this morning on the PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Our capable crew is uh, chasing it out of the building. Good to see you today. Happy Father's Day again. Glad that you're part of our worship service. In fact, speaking specifically to fathers, so if you're not a dad, you can just take a big, deep breath. <laughs> but if you are, buckle your seatbelt. No. Just to share some, what I think would be some words of wisdom. Some of y'all might, if we were doing the scripture reading, some of y'all have already figured out that the scripture reading is the text for the sermon we we're preaching that day, so I applaud you, but that's the way it works every week in case you hadn't caught on to that just yet. But you thought that might have been a strange scripture reading this morning about the Gibeonites trying to trick the children of Israel into uh, believing that they were from a far country. If you're not familiar with that story, it is, it's, an, it's an amazing passage of scripture. Uh, the context is the children of Israel have come out of 40 plus years of wandering the wilderness. They've crossed the Jordan. They uh, won the battle at Jericho. They failed at Ai. They went back and got a word from God and succeeded at Ai. And just down the road, not so many miles, was another little community where the Gibeonites lived. And as you read in the text how that they were, they were pretty freaked out because the, there was such success granted to the Jews as they began to take the lamb. And uh, so they come up with this big ruse, you know, this great story. They put on old clothes and, and old sandals that are tattered and worn, and their food sources are dry and crumbly and molded. And the provisions are just, you know, uh, look like they looks like they've been on the road for a long, long time. They come to the elders and to Joshua and tell them, "Oh man, we've heard all that, you know, that that that's going on with you guys. We've come from a faraway country, which is a lie. We're here to be the servants of Israel. They've put in all this flattery. They say we heard about what you did, the Amorite kings on the other side of the river, uh, and you know, we've just walked for weeks just to get here, just to, to celebrate your victory, and they would say that we want to be your friend." And they just spin this tale full of half-truths and, and deception of all kinds. And they haven't come from a faraway place at all. In fact, just around the corner, about 25 miles of the next cities will be conquered are the cities of the Gibeonites. So they come up with this great tale for, to enter into a, a covenant and a treaty uh, with the children of Israel. In fact, they, it's interesting, as the, as the passage read in Joshua, that verse we started with, said that, uh, you know, that they, uh, that the, Gibeonites had heard about the victory at Jericho and at Ai. And as the Gibeonites go and tell their story, they don't bring up Jericho and Ai because they're such near neighbors. They just talk about those distant battles that the children of Israel had. There's some great lessons to be learned from this. That's why we titled the message, Our Father's Wisdom. And there's certainly some things that we can draw from the story and certain parallels to our life today so that we can be discerning. And that's why that subtitle is about, you know, how to be a discerning dad. I started to say how to be discerning or dumb, but dumb's pretty obvious, and, and it's, it's usually the first route most of us will go anyway. You might not like that, but that's usually the truth, amen? So, but there are some lessons to be learned the hard way. I was thinking about this and, and thinking about, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a deal called the Chevy Nova Awards, all right? It's, it's like the awards that are given out to, for, to in, in kind of a mock humorous kind of way for for bad marketing ideas, marketing ploys that just did no good, no way. And so, so at these, usually at the annual, there's this list listed out of the, the annual Chevrolet Nova Awards. And it's taken because the Chevrolet Nova had a terrible marketing scheme. Some of y'all are old enough to remember the Chevy Nova, right? And uh, so they wanted to sell the Nova down in Central America, all right? So they come up with this great Spanish marketing ad, but they didn't take one thing into account that no va in Spanish is no go. So here they are trying to sell the no go car. <laughs> so it, it didn't work well. It, it's similar to another marketing scheme that was brought up in, in Miami by some t-shirt designers. When the Pope was going to visit Miami, they wanted to you know, uh, make t-shirts that said, I saw the Pope, all right? And so they produced and they said, well, better yet, you know, let's get the Spanish influence, you know, because we have all this Hispanic community in, in, in Miami area, so let's make up some shirts for the Spanish community too. And it said, and, you know, the English is, I saw the Pope, but the Spanish version was, I saw the potato. <laughs> El Papa is the Pope, all right. La Papa is the potato. So another smash Brilliant idea down the drain with that. And there's so many others. Coca-Cola was in China doing one of those. They won the award one year. Uh, their first read was Kikukule, and it meant uh, bite the wax tadpole. 
didn't quite translate what they were trying to say for Coca-Cola. And in another dialect, it was the female horse stuffed with wax. So uh, depending on the dialect, uh, so the marketing failed, they finally came up with a phrase that, that translated well. It was called happiness in the mouth. So anyway, for Coca-Cola, Pepsi didn't do much better when they went into China with their uh, uh, come alive with the Pepsi generation. When it was translated correctly out and uh, incorrectly, it came out that Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. So... <laughs> There are some bad marketing ideas that come across and bad marketing schemes and hopefully that people learn from their failures. Uh, the children of Israel have had some failures at, in their battles. Jericho was a great success, if you remember the story. They go to Ai, they deliberate among themselves. Ai is just a little place. We can take them pretty easily. We don't need to do, uh, send all our troops. And, and they didn't consult the Lord, all right? And then they had a tremendous failure. So they finally go back. They consult the Lord. The Lord gives them the battle plan. They go and, and march into the battle and, and, and take care of whatever's necessary. With it. What are we doing here? <laughs> okay. It'd been better to go off. <laughs> but anyway, so they come back. They don't learn anything from Ai. And here they are, they're faced with another situation. Before the battle begins, there's another battle that's brewing. It's not a frontal assault like they're, they're expecting from anybody. It's a battle uh, of, of, of uh, deceit. And it's a battle of delusion. It's a battle of, of, of arrogance, really. And you would think that Israel had learned the lesson from Ai where they did not consult the Lord. Once again, in verse 14 of chapter 9, it says, and they did not consult the Lord. So you have it there. As a dad... As a grandfather, as a man, as a woman, as a kid, we have to understand that our battles really aren't, if we're Christians, they really are not necessarily physical battles. And that we're doing battle on a spiritual battleground in a spiritual realm and that we're always at war. We may have victories and we should celebrate our victories and rejoice in our victories, but a victory in a battle never means the war is over, all right? And a failure in a battle doesn't mean the war is over as well. So we have to understand that if we're going to be leaders and, 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 and protectors and providers, especially as men, then we're going to have to learn to be discerning men and, and to live with some kind of level of, of discernment and, and, and leaning towards the Lord to get instruction from him. Because the secret to winning any war is always strategy. And the secret certainly to winning a spiritual battle is a divine strategy that we're hearing from God. Why? Because the devil, number one, he never quits, all right? And he's always assaulting us. And it's not always in the way that we think it would be. And so we need to realize the devil's a subtle guy. He has many allurements. He has a lot of different schemes and methods. The apostle said we're not, we're not ignorant of his devices, you know, and, and that word device really means we're not ignorant. It's a word for method, all right? We're not ignorant of Satan's methods, and the means that he uses to deceive us or to, to distract us or to destroy us. Unfortunately, as you look around the world we're living in today, in the contemporary culture, and Christians within the contemporary culture, uh, you see that there's a lot of Christians that are just absolutely gullible on so many levels. And I'm talking about old Christians, young Christians, Christians of all different kinds, sizes, and sorts, and denominations, all right? There's just a, a unique gullibility. This story shows how God's people can really be gullible and believe a lie. And, and there's some points, if you follow the story, if you're familiar with it, or if you listen to when we read it, where the children of Israel, they kind of say, okay, okay, hold on, hold on, let, let, let me, are you sure? And they consult and say, you know, these guys may be around us just trying to trick us. But instead of seeking the Lord, instead of finding out what the truth is, they just kind of go along with it and fall right into the trap. So there's some things I want to capture from today's story, three or four things I think that'll help you as a man, even as a woman or a young person in this room, anybody, but especially for men and on Father's Day, I think it would be an encouragement to you to hear these things that we can learn from this particular thing and from other people's failures. The first thing I want you to see is about a, how to be a discerning dad is you have to understand the subtlety and the uniqueness of Satan. There was a little suspicion. They were kind of talking to these guys about, is this the truth? But they, they, had, they were ready with their combat. Oh, look at, our, look at our shoes. They're all wore out in these clothes. You think, you think we would wear this normally? We've come from a long way, and our sandals are worn out. And the, look at our bread. It's moldy, and it's dry, and, it, and it, it's crumbled. These guys just go with their lie. In fact, if you follow the story, they tell five lies, all right? They, they break it out. says, we've come from a very far country. The truth of the matter is, 25 miles away. 
That's all they, oh, we've been traveling for weeks. They lied about their clothing and their food. Verse 12 says they had moldy bread. <laughs> so they, they took moldy bread to start with. They lied about themselves. They gave this impression that they were, they were important envoys and leaders of their people. They called themselves your servants. They were not. They said that in verse 8, verse 9, verse 11. We're your servants. We're your servants. We're your servants. They weren't there to be their servants. They were there for deception. And they said, we're, we're here because of the name of the Lord in verse 9. Now, that's a unique one. If you're going to be discerning your spiritual life, you're going to have to realize the devil loves to use the Bible in a twisted, perverted way. He loves to take things out of context. He loves to twist the truth. He did this with Jesus. You know, in, in Jesus' temptation, he's just taking Scripture, quoting it to Jesus, but it was a misrepresentation. It was a twist on what the truth of the matter really was. And so Jesus just corrects his theology by quoting the Scripture back to him. We don't have that intelligence to do that sometimes when we should. Some of us have been saved long enough to know how that works, but yet we just kind of fall right in line and we get deceived by the same enemy. Understand that when Satan, we talk about a strategy, Satan has a unique strategy. He doesn't always come straight on front up, all right? Especially to those who've been saved for a longer time and should have some knowledge and some maturity by, by, behind them as in, their, in, in, their, in their arsenal. But Satan loves this, these side door methods and he, he loves the back door methods and he, he loves to come in ways that you would never expect him. And he loves to twist and pervert the scriptures, as I've said. And you, hey, they're, they're, that is a genuine tactic of the enemy. And by the way, people are like that as well. You know, people learn these lessons real quick. They learn how to use words and flattery to, to persuade you or to misdirect you or flat just abuse and use you sometimes. Amen. I remember years ago, uh, Kathy and I, uh, uh, it's before the church, we were in evangelism, a young couple. I don't think we had kids at this point. We went to vote, and we're in the voting line here in spring, and, you know, it, it, we think the courthouse, wherever it was going, we're voting. And uh, we're in line with this couple, and, of course, Kathy, she never meets strangers, you know, so she always prepares the audience for me. And so <laughs> she's talking to everybody around us, and we're, you know, and, and she... Uh, so I was talking to this young couple that, that was standing there with us, and they kind of came at us like, oh, man, we're so glad to meet you guys. We, oh, you're in ministry. Oh, great. We've been having some struggles as a young couple and, you know, kind of coming on like we need this counseling and this direction, and we're so glad we met you. So Kathy and I are kind of talking off the side as they go into the boat. So why don't, why don't we invite them over to the house, you know, for dinner? All right? So we can minister to them. So... The day comes, they're supposed to come over, and they come over, and they're so happy to be there, and they come in, and we sit down for dinner, and it's just kind of chit-chat conversation, waiting for the, the platform to really open for ministry there, you know, and getting to know them a little bit. And so by the time we're done with dinner, uh, this young husband, he gets up and goes to our bathroom. And a couple minutes later, he comes out and, and breaks into the conversation. He's like, well, I just went through your bathroom. I looked in the cabinets and underneath the cabinets. First of all, I'm getting ready to shoot the guy about this time, but I, I was cool. <laughs> and I noticed that you didn't have any particular products. And, uh, you know, it's, it was Amway, you know. And they had no interest in being counseled at all. They had no interest in hearing what the Lord had to say to them. They had no interest in their spiritual walk, their marriage. They were there to sell and promote a product, and that was their technique to get in the door. Uh, now, I'm not saying anything against Amway or any other plan or whatever you sell or whatever you do, but, hey, don't lie to people about it, amen? Just be straight up with folks. But, you know, that, that conversation didn't last long, and we ushered them on out to the, to the door. So, tell you what, don't, let's not show my sermon at all on the slides. We'll be okay because going in and out just distracts. You can show it to our live stream people if you, if you like. But, anyway, so it was just, it, this is just the way that, that, that the enemy works as well. He uses little half-truths, little 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 especially spiritual stuff. How many times as, 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 as pastors, I've sat in big meetings with pastors and it always gets around to different people who like to knock on the door of the church and ask for something. And also often they've just been at every church in the community, all right, to get something from them. And they're not really interested in getting real help or genuine help. And there are people that do come and they need genuine help and it takes discernment to, to figure that out and to weigh that out and, you know, to, to discover. And so we, we want to help people. That's why we're here. But there are some people that will abuse the body of Christ, all right, and they'll abuse the church. They, they want you to give them some of this or give them some of that. And it's never about giving them what they really need, truth and counsel that will literally change and transform their life. 
But this is, this is what Satan's technique in life. And as, 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 as believers, as men, as dads, we need to be discerning. We need to be realized that, you know, that, uh, that there, there are those who are deceivers and those that are tricksters and those that are out there uh, just simply to gain an advantage. And, and they're not real seekers of help. They're sneakers, all right? And they just sneak around and you know, use whatever method they can to get from, from you whatever you need, whatever they need that you can give them. And unfortunately, we are loving people as believers, right? That's not the unfortunate part. That sometimes we can be loving without wisdom and loving without discernment and loving without seeking God's counsel to really get down to give people what they really need. Paul wrote the church at Corinth, and he's trying to warn them about all of Satan's devices and how we're not ignorant of those things. In verse 14 of chapter 11, he says, Satan will just transform himself into an angel of light. You know, he'll, make it, he'll lead you down a path which is not a godly path at all, but he just sprinkles enough Bible verses in it for, to, 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 to con you and to, to get you to go away or to go astray from where the Lord has you. Uh, later on that same passage he talked about in verse 3 or earlier, that he said, I fear lest some of you somehow, as the serpent has deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. He says, stay true to Christ. It's about a faith walk. It's about a faith life. And, you know, there, there, is, there are multitudes of things that, that come against churches that sound good and that sound like their Bible, but they're not. There's movements and there's doctrines that are false doctrines. The Bible says in the last days the church would be infiltrated with doctrines of demons, all right? The lying, lying doctrines that just aren't the Word of God at all, where people take a snippet, take a portion, and build a doctrine. He said, we, just need, we don't need to be so gullible. It happens in the secular life we live as well, where Satan comes in. It's, it's like the, the, the young uh, girl who goes out with the young boy, and he says, you know, I really love you. I love you. I love you. And she said, well, I love you, too. Well, if you love me, then you'll prove it. And here's the way you prove it. And through that con artist mentality, that lying, manipulating deceit, they just rob and stay, take and steal. And it goes on as, as adults. It happens all the time. And, and sometimes it's so subtle. You, you, you know, God's called you to be a steward over what you have in life, right? And Satan will come up and appeal to you with things that literally steal your time. And his dad, time's a valuable commodity, sir. And so you need to make sure that, to understand you only have so much time and you need to allocate that time and be disciplined with your time so that Satan doesn't steal your time. And so you learn how to use It's the same thing with your money. Satan's always looking to get you to abuse and to, to, to not be a good steward of your income or the money that he places in your hands. And so you have to be a good steward of what he even puts in your hands that way. It's like, oh, you, you, I know you don't have the money, but boy, you deserve a shopping spree. Whip out that credit card. Sink yourself in deeper debt. Those are never the words he used. It's usually that you deserve. It's you deserve. You're the best. Nobody appreciates you but you, so you might as well spend something on you, right? It's, that you, it, it, it's, it's so subtle, and all of a sudden you're running credit cards out the max and having all kinds of financial issues. Oh, we've got trouble now. And now, now that you've got trouble, you don't have anything to give to God, especially because you need that. God's got everything. Preacher said God owns everything. Everything. <laughs> So we just get wrapped up in these little subtle lies as, as men, as women, as, as, as people. We just latch on to something because it sounded good, but this is the culture. He likes to come and deceive us in areas where maybe we just haven't get been, God hasn't spoken to us about something on yet. We're learning the process, so Satan loves to manipulate those kind of things. And one thing that Satan will always do whether it's through individuals, through the culture, he'll always seek to move you away from solid, absolute truths. That's not been under attack in, in, our, in, in our culture, you know, for a long time, that there really are no absolutes, that really everything is just, it's situational, it, it's situation ethics, it depends on what's really going on, if that applies or not. But if it applies or not, it doesn't depend on the situation, nor your personal morality, it depends on, you know, what the Bible teaches. The Bible just says some things are right, some things are wrong, no matter what anybody else might say. But I think that especially in this culture we're living in with the, with the cancel culture and the woke culture, you know, I'm woke. Listen, I got woke in 1973 when I gave my life to Jesus. Most everybody else been asleep. 
<laughs> I'm woke to that life is in Christ. I'm woke to the fact there's no life without Christ. I'm woke to the fact that if I live for Christ, I have the grace of God on my life and the blessings of God on my life. And I'll get through anything that life throws at me, the devil throws at me, I can get into it and get through it in victory. All right? The woke culture today just means that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what's happening in the culture. I've listened to the media. I've listened to the proponents and the experts of, of the culture, you know, and it doesn't have anything to do with what the Bible says, but here's what the culture dictates now. You know, the Bible's really kind of an old book, or it's really kind of, it's still open. We've talked about theology before when it talks about uh, in the last days what people do, the truth and the Word of God, they, they just reject it or they seek to change it. Or what we have, what's called open theism, you know, well, God's still changing his mind about stuff. The Bible says God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't get sucked into this thing that there's really no moral absolutes and there's, there's no really ethical or unethical things according to God's Word. You've got to listen to what the media says or you've got to listen to where the culture is dictating and you've got to listen to what, what people are doing and what people are saying because that's the way to go. What is the most acceptable and what is the most popular thing? But understand that mindset and that culture leaves completely out what does God say, what does the Bible say, what is righteous, what is unrighteous, what is moral and what is immoral. No, th those aren't issues anymore. It's just what I want and what I think is best or what I think is right. And you get into trouble. One of, one of Satan's ultimate efforts in the life of any Christian is to move you away from truth, to get you to the place where maybe you're not all the way out there in the midst of the darkness, but you've begun to compromise, all right? You've become to just let little things go here and look, oh, well, I used to have that conviction, but I don't have it anymore. I used to believe like that, but I don't believe anymore. Hey, whatever you believe, make sure it's, it's, it's based on truth, all right? Not what you think and not what you feel. The Bible makes it clear it's not for private interpretation. So if we're going to be discerning men, we've got to realize that Satan is subtle. His, front, his, his attacks aren't always frontal. Sometimes they're back door and sometimes they're side door. We just can't come to the place of compromise. Verse 14 in chapter 9 lays it very clearly where Israel made their stake, mistake. It said, they did not seek counsel from the Lord. James chapter 1 says this, if anybody, any man, any person lacks wisdom, you can ask God. What? <laughs> you can ask God, and you can expect that God will answer. All right? Uh, now, you can, you can sense things on other levels, but you've got to come back to what does the Lord say. So that's discerning point number one, discerning dad number two. Discerning dads, they learn from the mistakes of other people. I'm not going to mess with this because we're not using it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> If we were using it on the board, would pop up two, Satan, two areas where Satan loves to attack all of us. One is in the area of uh, our pride. That's step number one. That's the problem number one, amen, that you know that uh, you know best, you know right, you, you make your own decisions, you decide what you think is right. You know, you don't worry about what the world says. It just what, doesn't matter what God says. It matters what I say, all right? Pride is what usually gets us into trouble. Humility says I'll listen to what the Lord says and I'll respond to that. The other thing that we get, we get attacked upon is the area of just basic, physical, rational things like what I see, how I feel, you know, what my senses are dictating, how I think about it. And, you know, we all have a mind, and it all works in different ways, and it's all, our minds are all influenced by all these different thoughts and ideas. But we need to have a mind that is committed to the Lord. The Bible says you love the Lord God with your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul. So making sure that our thoughts are not based upon the culture or our selfishness, but our thoughts are based upon, you know, what is the will of God and what is the word of God and what is the way of God in this situation? Because God desires to give us direction. God's not trying to play hide and seek with us. The leaders failed when they didn't say, okay, God, what about this? And they just went on. Psalms 37 is a passage we've used a lot where it says, you know, trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily you shall be failed. He says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. He'll bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth your righteousness as light, and catch this, and your judgment as the noonday. And that's translated a lot of ways, but I think you could actually say it this way. When you commit your way to the Lord, what you're making decisions on, the judgments you're making in life, is this the direction I'm going to go, or is that the direction to go? How am I going to respond to that person? How am I going to relate to that situation? Those judgments, those decisions need to be spirit-led, all right, and spirit-directed. And he tells us here's how that can take place. He says, you commit your ways to the Lord. You trust in the Lord. You commit to the Lord. Remember, you remember evangelist Mickey Bonner. First time I heard this passage preached by an evangelist, he was sharing, commit your way to the Lord, and he, he was sharing what that meant. He said, it's like, it's like a, a guy with a big backpack on, and he's burdened, and he's carrying this heavy load, 
and he says he commits the load to another guy who's going to volunteer to carry the backpack. So there's a way that literally it rolls it off one side and off to the other side onto the other person. Basically, it's roll your burden onto the Lord. All right, roll the decision processes over to the Lord. You're in a pressured situation, maybe, and it's a difficult choice. Commit that to the Lord. He says he'll call it, he'll, he'll establish your thought. He'll tell you what direction you need to go. Proverbs puts it this way. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, verse 3 through 6. Commit your work to the Lord. Same word. Commit your way to the Lord. And your thoughts will be established. Wow. I mean, I, that God will give me some direction in my thoughts. Yes, he will. If you commit your way to the Lord. If you, he says, the Lord has made all things for himself, the wicked for the day of judgment. Everyone that's proud is an abomination of the Lord. Even though hand joined in hand, you shall not be punished. But mercy and truth, that's how iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men will turn from evil. In other words, we're, we're following the Lord. We're, we're committing to the Lord. The, the Apostle Paul put it this way. He says, I'm persuaded that God is able to keep that which I've committed to him. So that if I've committed my life, I've committed my, my choices and my direction to the Lord, and to be glor glorifying God and let God lead them in. He says that, you know, I've committed to him. God's able to keep me. God's able to do in me what needs to be done. He's able to give, give me the direction I need. He's able to give me the guidance I need. I can listen and God will speak to my heart and my mind. And he'll, he'll guide my life. The children of Israel, this is where, this is where they, they just couldn't get to this point where, you know, they were learning not just understanding the subtlety of Satan, but when it comes down here, these discerning dads, they, they learn from those mistakes of others. They learn, you know, what Israel did not learn the first time at Ai that they should have learned to put into practice with the Gibeonites. And so they just fell into another trap. We need to be able, as, as, as men, as, in fact, as anybody in this room, as Christians, to look around and see where others have failed and say, you know, I'm not standing here to judge that person. I'm not going to pass judgment because that's God's business. I'm just going to love them, but hey, I can certainly learn from their failures. All my education shouldn't have to be for my own failure. Paul told the church, of course, all these things that happened to them were written for our example. All right? So that we can learn from it. I know most of us, you know, we still fall in that, that same trap of failures in our own life. But the tragedy is that we not only learn from ours, but we can learn from other people's mistakes as well. What do we learn here? Well, I think one is, lesson number one is ask God about everything. Ask God before every decision. Ask God for the, especially when it comes to major decisions in your life. Two is what the Gibeonites came and they deceived and they talked the children of Israel into making a covenant peace treaty with them. All right? Which is a covenant treaty that can't be broken. All right? I think a lesson here is don't promise something you're not willing to keep. Don't, don't make a vow if you're not going to keep the vow. It doesn't say don't make vows, period. It says we should make commitments. We should have commitments. We commit to the Lord. I commit it to my life. I, I plan on keeping my commitment. But don't promise people stuff, and especially for dads, don't promise people things you can't do or you will not do in the future. You can't say, well, I didn't know, because that's, that's what happens here. When the children of Israel realized what was going on, they said everybody started ang in anger, grumbling against the leadership. I mean, they're ticked off. You guys made a bad decision. Let's tell them now, not the leaders, but the giving. Let's deal with it. And they said, we made a vow. We made a promise. We made a covenant with them, and we're not going to break it. That's not the culture we live in today. In fact, the Bible says one thing that will mark the end time culture prophetically will be that people will be truth breakers. They won't keep the promise. Promises are cheap. Promises can be changed. Promises can be broken, but not according to God's world. If you don't promise something, you're not going to keep the promise. And if you do make the promise, then do it, all right? Also, you learn from this, I think, if we learn from the mistakes of others, is that we learn that God is faithful. We learn that God's word is true. And we learn that God has everything in control. Psalm 15, 4 says, He may dwell in the presence of God in the sanctuary, God. He that keeps his oath. He that keeps his word, even when it hurts. I didn't know what it was going to be like. How many people made a promise to do something and came back and said, Oh, I didn't know it was going to be that hard. You quit. I didn't know it was going to be that difficult. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have done it. You did it. You said it. You do it. It's basically. 
The third point of this is discerning dads learn how to trust, and this is so important, this is trust in the sovereignty of God. I do believe that God is over all things. You know, that, 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 that he can do what he wants to do whenever he wants to do because what? He's God. Children of Israel have made this alliance, basically an alliance they shouldn't have made. You can call it an unholy alliance if you want, but they made an alliance. And now they're committed to that alliance. And what are you going to do? This is going to be pain and misery for the rest of our life because we did this. And that's where most of us feel when we made a bad decision when we just sinned against God. We kind of revel in our failures and in our defeat, not seeing the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God said, well, Romans 8, the apostle put it this way, God makes all things work together for good. All things. But what about my, what about my failure? All things. What about that bad choice? All things. What about that, that, that sin? All things. That's great. That certainly doesn't say, well, I'm just going to go live how I want to. We don't understand grace, is what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 6. So we continue in sin, the grace may abound. God forbid. You don't get it, all right? We hate sin. It limits us in, in so many different ways when we choose to live that kind of life. But what God can do with our failures and with our sin is do something supernatural that shoves it right back in the devil's face, and it becomes a backfire on him. If we only will respond to God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. And so often people fail to do that, and they just continue, well, there's no way out of this, or I just blew it now, and this is going to be miserable. Hey, God, God keeps his covenant with us even when we fail. So we keep our covenant. The men of Israel, at least at this point, understood the value of making a covenant, how it was, a, it was unbreakable. But what we need to understand is that we do fail like they did fail, that God is a redeemer. And God is a restorer. And God is a big God. And God is a merciful God. And God is a loving God. And thank God that he is a forgiving God. So if I understand that I should do what? I should get my heart and repent. I should get over myself and get in with God and God's word and God's will for my life. And say, God, I, I come to you in my humility and I ask you to forgive me. And it's interesting to note that when you go on, don't read it right now, but you can read the rest of the story this afternoon, and you'll see how there were more five kings that had to defeat. And how all this played into all that. Because God is sovereign. God will not be mocked. God's not going to be mocked by the Gibeonites. God's not going to be mocked by some con artist in your life. God's not going to be mocked by some, some, some lying person who misled you in some way. All right? And God's not going to be mocked by you. So we understand the sovereignty of God. We understand that God is able to do things beyond our comprehension of the worst things that have happened in our life. The fourth thing and the last thing about discerning dads is this. They learn to make the mistakes and the failures to work for them, for them and God's purpose for their life. They can willingly look at their defeat and willingly look at their failure and say, I messed up there. And then say, how can I organize that into something for the glory of God? Ultimately, the giving, as you know how the children of Israel is, you read the story, it says they became servants to the, to the house of the Lord. They made the Gibeonites become water bearers and, and wood bearers to bring the wood for the sacrifices, for the, temple, for the tabernacle offering, and to bring the water for the service of, 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 the, of the worship in the tabernacle. They became servants of God. They, they became uh, yielded in, to a place where they, they just co cooperated in what was going on. They put them to work. And they became, as they said in their own mind, we are servants of the Lord. They said, okay, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> You're servants of the Lord. And if you look at them, there's several mentions in Scripture. One's in 1 Chronicles 9, another in Ezra chapter 2, and I think another is in Nehemiah around chapter 3, where he talks about the Gibeonites again. But there's no place in the history, of, at least we see in, in Israel's history in the Bible, that is recorded where the Gibeonites ever were a problem in later years. In fact, some theologians believe that the, that the Gibeonites in doing service in the temple were so, for the Lord were so influenced by the worship of God's people that, they, you know, that, that it worked out for their own righteousness in their life and surrender their lives. God always makes the devil's plans backfire if we're willingly participate with grace and God in our life. And what you thought would be a terrible tragedy in your life becomes a glorious blessing. There's a story of, um, some of you may be familiar with the ex-Colorado head football coach, Bill McCartney, his quarterback, while he was coaching, a guy named Sal Anish, 
contracted stomach cancer, and he died at the age of 21. Before he died, Coach McCartney had had the opportunity of leading his quarterback to Jesus and giving his life to Christ in the midst of all that was going on. In September of 1989, McCartney stood up at the Jesus uh, style funeral, several thousand people there. As he stood before the crowd, he acknowledged something that uh, most people didn't know. That Sal was the father of his daughter's six-month-old child. Bill McCartney turned to his daughter and said, Christy, you know I love you very much. And I am so thankful. You could have had an abortion. You could have made that decision legally in this country. But I'm so glad that you didn't, that you didn't go that way, but you stayed. You stayed true to the Lord in the midst of that moment, giving us the opportunity to watch this child of Sal's and yours grow up to be a man one day. To some that should have been maybe an embarrassment, a disgrace to the culture. God turned that into a blessing for that family and the loss they were experiencing. Let's just think about this for a moment. Here they give an acts, they come with deception. So we should learn that whatever decision we're making with our families, our own lives, we should learn to be people of wisdom, that we ask God for counsel. Because we always end up in trouble when we don't. I think we should also learn the importance of showing integrity in the way that we do business or our life with other people. We come to the point where Jesus put it this way. Let your yea be yea. Your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't, don't lie to people. Don't compromise this area. Let, what you say, let it be the truth. If you say no, it's no. If you say yes, it's yes. Nobody has to guess. I think one of the great lessons I get out of this, though, and we ought to get as discerning dads would be, God gives grace to people who don't deserve it. If you think you deserve it, you haven't seen just how far you've fallen from the Lord. Amen. But God gives grace to people who don't deserve it when they'll come to him in humility. For if we confess our sins, God is faithful to us and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, some things just don't change automatically when we do that, do they? Some things have been done. But God is able to take those things that have been done and even turn them for his glory. That's the mighty God we serve. Amen. That's the glory of God. So discerning dads, they see the subtlety of Satan. They're willing to learn from the mistakes of other people. They understand the big God that we serve is a sovereign God. And they learn to make the failures work for the glory of God in their life. You have a testimony as somebody who didn't know the Lord and perhaps somebody who gave their life to the Lord. Well, there's nothing wonderful about my testimony of what I was before the Lord. <laughs> but I'll sure use it for the glory of God. Saying, here's what God can do. Here's what God did do. Here's how God can change a life. Here's how God can change a man. Praise God for grace. I'm going to ask you to just remain seated for a moment. There you can come with the band. And uh, as they come, even though the hardest message obviously has been for dads, there's a lesson for everybody to learn here. But I know how the Spirit of God works in my life, and I'm sure it's pretty much the same with everybody, that whenever we're gathered as a, as a fellowship and whether we gather as God's people, God has a way of just speaking to us. I, I, you know, I, there's been so many errors as a dad that I've made in my life. You know, any perfect dads in the room? Nobody's raising their hand good because I'm not raising mine that I am. I'm just saying I've made errors, mistakes. And I know that God has always been faithful. But perhaps you're sitting there and you're still kind of chained down to something, a failure. And maybe you're still caught in it. It's time to break free from that thing. God is still in the redemption business. And come to him in your heart and your life and you say, God, I'm here You've seen my mess this up. And I'm wrong and I ask you to forgive me. God's still forgiving. Amen. 
So if you see some area, know that God can transform that. But the changes may not have yet come because you haven't been willing to surrender them to the Lord yet. Don't wait for God to do something first. He's waiting on you. All right? If my people, in other words, God said, I'm ready. So whatever the Lord has said to you, respond to that. And again, maybe not a dad, a, a mom, a grandma, a, a young person in this room. If God spoke to your heart, what would keep you from just getting it all out there today and just say, Lord, here it is in my life, and just lay it all on the altar. And just give it to him. Surrender it all. I'm going to ask each of you just to bow your head right there where you're seated. And I'm going to ask you just in your own heart, in your own way, in your own spirit, in the quietness and the solitude of your own mind, just respond to whatever the Spirit of God has said to you today. As a man, as a woman, whatever he said to you. And thank him for his precious blood that washes away all sin. And thank him for his grace. Praise God for grace. At the same time, commit your way to the Lord, as it says in Psalms and Proverbs. Commit and trust. Commit and trust. Now, just for dads here today, if you're a dad, I want you just to stand to your feet, just right there where you are. You don't need to come forward. Just stand up, dads and granddads. Stand to your feet, would you? I want to pray for you, and I want to pray over you today. I want to ask God just for a, a, a blessing over your life. So I'm going to ask you just right there where you are with your head bowed. Let me, let me pray over you and pray for you. Father, this is a difficult and critical time, Lord, that we live in. You know that far more than we do. Lord, we can determine, discern from the Word of God that these, the last days, the most critical, chaotic, difficult days to, to be dads and parents and grandparents in. We need to be discerning. So I pray for these men, Lord Jesus, that as they surrender, as they commit, and as they trust, that today you would give them the thoughts that are your thoughts. Give them a heart that's your heart. Give them a passion that comes from you first and foremost. Guide them and guard them. And wherever the enemy has laid one hand on their life or their family, we rebuke the devil and his demons in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, and by the power of God's word and the power of the blood of the Lamb, we claim your victories today. We pray, Father, and agree with you that all things do work together. So we pray for that, we believe that, and you promise that. And so we trust you for that. Bless these men. Bless their lives. Bless their homes. Bless their families. May you use them in these days to give guidance and clarity and direction to those around them and their world. For your glory, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise God and praise God. Is he a great God? Amen, amen. Brother Gary's got a few closing announcements and a testimony, I think, so she comes. And then happy Father's Day again, gentlemen. Amen. Amen. A couple of closing announcements. Uh, fathers, um, as you exit, there are going to be some youth out there. They have a, you have a, we're giving you a free Father's Day gift. So if you exit the main door uh, or if they miss you there, the, the, the uh, door exiting the church, or if you go to our fellowship hall, we're having our bake sale, they'll get you there. So one way or another, you're, if you're here today as a father, you're going to get a, a free Father's Day gift. Uh, VBS is this Friday, June 25th, so start praying for our workers. Uh, we did a, a Facebook boost, I think, or late, mid, late last week, like Wednesday or Thursday, and Pastor Matt got 40, 45 kids signed up that we weren't even accounting for that usually comes. So that's 45 brand new kids. That's 45 brand new families. So be praying for, for them. We're doing something a little different. This is a one-day VBS from 9 to 3.30. Um, if you've ever gone, helped with VBS, you know, that Monday is great because you have 100% attendance. By Thursday, 
not so much. And so Pastor Matt decided, hey, let's just try something different. Uh, let's not do VBS just to say we did VBS, but make it purposeful, meaningful. And, and so we're doing a one-day VBS. We'll be praying for Pastor Matt and his leaders and for the kids that will be coming um, and for changed hearts. Amen. Uh, we started our men's Bible study this past Wednesday night. We're going to continue that this Wednesday night. Our women's Wednesday evening Bible study started last Wednesday. Again, it'll, it'll uh, continue this Wednesday as well. Also, we're having a Tuesday women's Bible study that starts this Tuesday at 10 o'clock here at the church. Uh, see Linda McMillan for more information regarding that. That starts this Tuesday for our morning ladies that want to attend that. Um, we have Journey 101 next week uh, at 3.30. Please sign up so that we can get an estimate or, or a, a count on how many people are going to be doing that. If you've done 101, now you can do 201. Uh, and then don't forget to connect, uh, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and bfchurch.com. For our, for our first-time guests, if you're, here for, if you're here for our first time, we do have a free gift for you as you exit. Um, if you could fill out the welcome card in the seat back in front of you at the end of the service out in the foyer, we'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. Three ways to tithe, tithe online, in person, or you could drop it off the church uh, Monday through Thursday. And at this time, I'm going to have Pastor Matt come up and give a testimony and then one final announcement, and he will dismiss you. All right, so we just got back from our kids' camp on Tuesday, and we had just an incredible time. We took 16 of our very own children. At this camp, there was over 400, which is pretty awesome. But from our 16, eight of them were first-time camp attenders. So we did have a, a pretty young group. But I can tell you that we have, uh, from the 16, we had about nine who are asking more questions about salvation. And so we don't just lead into just a, a generic prayer. We really want to work with them. And so please be praying for those kids that went to camp that are asking more about salvation. We're going to be working with them over the next couple of weeks. But I just want to thank you. Take this time to thank you guys. You guys really helped support them to get them to camp between the fundraisers and the donations. So thank you guys. Give yourselves a round of applause to get them to camp. You guys are awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Because of your help, we got 16 to go to camp. Now, in one month, we are leaving for youth camp. We have 14 currently who are signed up for youth camp. Now, you have the opportunity to help send them to camp as well. We do have a bake sale following the service. It's in the fellowship hall, so I'm asking you guys when we dismiss, if you can head over, consider helping them out. Ladies, you know the, the quickest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> You have a great opportunity to get to his heart before you even leave the church, and that's through his stomach, through those doors right over there. We have some incredible homemade baked items that our youth have worked on to help uh, fundraise to get them to camp. So please consider that. We do have a, we ask for a minimum of 25 per baked item, but that doesn't mean you pay 25. If you feel led to do more, or hey, if you're somebody who just can't have the baked items, feel free to donate, or you know, I, I can have them consider that. <laughs> and at this time, I, I want to thank you guys again for helping get our kids to camp. I want to thank you in advance for helping get our youth to camp. And you are dismissed. Happy Father's Day.